Good afternoon, everybody. And we are at the third appointment in this ubiquitous quanta series of seminars. And actually, we have had a couple of lectures uh, from Professor Haven of the University of Leicester. Uh, first, general introduction uh, about the usage of uh, quantum tools and in general mathematical tools in, uh, in, in uh, economics field and in particular in finance. And then this morning, we have seen uh, some, some more detailed discussion about the usage of uh, econophysics, so to call them. Uh, tools in, uh, in, this, uh, in this field. This afternoon we will have two talks, uh, one from uh, Professor Barros, who comes from the San Francisco State University, and he will give something like a speculative talk uh, in the direction of what is irrational and what is irrational about irrationality. The second one will be the, the following part uh, of uh, this morning lectures about tools in econophysics. Uh, and it will, it will be given again by, by Professor Haven, so I do apologize for all those who, who may be in streaming and have lost the, the first part of the, of the talk. Uh, hopefully it will be understandable and uh, they do not need too many of the tools used in the morning to, to understand it. So I will straightforward leave the, uh, leave the this space to, to, our, to our guest, Professor De Barros, who I thank for, for having joined us and uh, giving us this lecture. And feel free to begin whenever you are ready. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Andrea and Sandra for inviting me here. Uh, to lecture. Uh, it's been a very, uh, I think, informative uh, uh, session for me. I'm learning lots of new things. And uh, hopefully, uh, we're going to talk about more stuff and uh, perhaps uh, uh, start a collaboration. Um, what I want to talk today is uh, about irrationality, pretty much. And I, I want to try to tell you guys a story that I think uh, makes sense. And uh, you can tell me whether it makes sense or not uh, at the end of it. But uh, um, w what I want to do is, uh, uh, as Andrea mentioned, be a little bit more wild than I would be uh, if it were a really, really technical talk. So I'll reserve the uh, more technical stuff for tomorrow. And many of the things that I'm going to be talking about here today, I'm going to go into uh, much more detail tomorrow. And uh, hopefully, uh, uh, some of the uh, issues that I'm going to raise are going to be much clearer tomorrow. But what I want to do today is just tell a more general story. And, uh, um, as uh, uh, Andrea said, it's very speculative. So uh, many of the things here may or may not be uh, right. Uh, we'll figure out, right? So uh, let's see. What I want to do is uh, first start with uh, the idea of what is rationality. And uh, well, it's not surprising that uh, there is a lot of disagreement about what, it's, what it means to be rational. And uh, in, particularly among philosophers. Philosophers never agree on anything. But uh, uh, there's lots of disagreement about what uh, is uh, irrational. And uh, um, I start with like a quote from the uh, Oxford Dictionary of Philosophy. And I'm going to read it to you. To accept something as rational is to accept it as making sense, as appropriate or required, or in accordance with some knowledge goal, such as aiming at truth or aiming at the good. So as you guys can see, it's a very broad definition. So pretty much anything can fit in that. So not anything, but many different things. So I want to get that uh, uh, idea of, irrational, of rationality as a starting point, and irrationality as being anything that doesn't fit that. Uh, and, and what I want to do today is try to talk a little bit about the origins of, irrational, uh, of rationality uh, and, and, and talk about it from uh, uh, the point of view of uh, evolution in a certain sense. And then uh, after I do that, I want to go back to uh, the uh, origins of rationality and think about where is it that those irrational things that we see uh, uh, come from. And then finally, uh, at the end, I'm, I'm going to talk about how to describe that irrationality. So when I'm thinking about describing, what, I really, what I'm really thinking about is creating mathematical models of irrationality. And uh, uh, you're going to see that I'm going to have two, two types of mathematical models uh, in mind with that very different uh, uh, characteristics to them. Now, let's start with the origins of uh, rationality. We start with this uh, very nice looking fella here. Here's the uh, Peranthropos uh, boisei. And uh, uh, this guy is very interesting for our story because this is a uh, species that was very, very successful about a million years ago. And its numbers were very, very large. So it's not, as you see, it's a Peranthropos, so it's not an Australopithecus, it's not one of our direct descendants, but it's from the same sort of like tree that we come from. 
Uh, it's a splitting on R3 early on. And uh, what made this guy tremendously successful is that it, he was really well adapted to the environment. In fact, if you look at the uh, jaw bones of this guy, uh, they, they, they uh, gave him the uh, uh, nickname of a uh, uh, nutcracker man because you see, you see those huge teeth and this huge jaw that crushed whatever he, he, he could chew. And uh, um, this guy was vegetarian. And uh, uh, he was really well adapted to eat certain types of roots that were uh, uh, very common in Africa at the time. So very successful species, did really, really well at the time. Now compare this guy to another very nice looking fella, right? Uh, Homo habilis, one of our direct uh, descendants. Well, we're the directly descended from uh, those guys here. At least uh, we believe we are. The difference between Homo habilis and uh, the Boisei is that Homo habilis was not really well adapted for the environment. But Homo habilis had some tricks under his sleeves. Well, he didn't wear clothes, but he had some tricks uh, 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 to use. And uh, one of the tricks was that he was omnivore. He could eat meat and he could eat uh, uh, plants. But the most important thing that uh, differentiated Boise, uh, uh, Habilis from the Boisei was that Habilis had a bigger brain. And the bigger brain made him inquisitive. And because he was inquisitive, he was able to uh, not only seek out sources of nutrition, uh, which allowed him to survive, but uh, 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 he could seek out sources of nutrition in a changing environment. Now, this guy was not doing as well as the Boisei. The Boisei had a very large number. This guy here had very small numbers. Uh, so it, it, it was sort of like not really doing well. But on the other hand, he was able to do something that the Boisei was not able to. He was able to survive a period of climatic change. We know that uh, climate changed at the time of those guys. And then uh, what happened is that the Boisei simply went extinct. It was sort of like an evolutionary dead end. Whereas the uh, Homo habilis did not go, well, sort of like went extinct, but it actually evolved into something else, which is us today, which come to our next spe species, the Homo sapiens. <laughs> right? Uh, the Homo sapiens. Uh, not necessarily better looking than the Boisei, or the, uh, but the uh, Homo sapiens uh, had something uh, very interesting to him, uh, which was, uh, we know that the Homo sapiens, for example, appeared about like uh, 200,000 years ago. Uh, those were where the first bones uh, were found. And we know that it was not doing well. There was a bottleneck of about 600. We can estimate those numbers because of DNA uh, drifts and uh, things like that. Uh, we know that there is a, a, a bottleneck uh, of uh, uh, 600 uh, 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 members of this species uh, about 150,000 years ago. Now, what is interesting about the uh, uh, Homo uh, uh, sa sapiens is that fossil evidence actually suggests that those guys were able to collect selfish uh, on the shore and then move inland to expand their uh, 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 area of foraging and then forage for food in land and then go back to collect shellfish. And to do that, they had to know when is it that you had the lowest tides. As we know, uh, uh, I don't know when we learned that, but uh, as we know from school, I guess, uh, the lowest tide happens when there is an alignment between the Earth, the Sun, and the Moon. And the, uh, either the moon is between Earth and Sun or is uh, the other side of uh, Earth. That's when you have maximum tide. And that happens with the lunar calendar. So uh, this uh, quote by Marian uh, uh, sort of like tells you how much we need to know about astronomy, which is that being an efficient human shellfish collector requires the novel connection of lunar patterns to tidal variations to self shellfish return rates and safety of collection. You want to collect the shellfish, but you, want, you don't want to die by being dragged by the waves that are coming. So you need to make sure that you're collecting them when the uh, uh, tides are uh, good for you to collect them. Um, substantial planning abilities and communication of complex parameters between group members. All of this is a signal that the enhanced working memory and executive functions of the modern human intellect are in place already 
at that time, about like 200,000 years ago. What I find fascinating about this story is that it tells us that 200,000 years ago, we're already doing astronomy. We're already looking at the uh, phases of the moon, using the phases of the moon and the relative position of the moon to know when is it that uh, 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 the tides are going to be the lowest. And it's important to, uh, uh, to understand how precisely we need to know that. Because uh, in modern days, uh, uh, modern day uh, hunter and gatherers, they need to know the positions of the, of the tides within hours. And very often, even the most skilled uh, 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 hunter and gatherers that gather shellfish miss uh, sometimes uh, 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 the times of the tides, which was essential for their survival. It's essential for the survival of the species at about 150,000 years ago because you see they're almost extinct. But the ability to actually make those connections between the environment and what's going on of inquiring about the environment, thinking about it, being curious about it, is what allowed us to survive yet another climate change, whereas other species simply met uh, an evolutionary dead, dead end. So this is uh, uh, the first part of what I wanted to talk about that. And then, of course, we can go a little bit further in history. And uh, uh, Homo sapiens uh, was able to uh, think about what are the connections that you have? And to remember very complicated connections, what we do is we start to tell stories, like I'm doing right now. I'm trying to tell you a story and trying to see if it makes sense. And that's what we uh, 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 start to do. And as the stories are being told, we have a need for those stories to make sense. Because if they don't make sense, we don't feel good about those stories. We, we sort of like feel a little bit uncomfortable with them. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, one of the uh, uh, great accomplishments of uh, humans was to figure out that uh, we could construct a formal structure that we call now classical logic that helped us analyze stories and make sure that those stories make sense. Now, um, of course, you guys know classical logic comes from uh, Aristotle's work. Uh, what many people don't realize is that classical logic comes from a collection uh, of uh, uh, works put in the organon by his uh, 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 disciples, uh, by Aristotle's disciples and followers, uh, but the organon was actually related to his rhetoric. So the, uh, the goal for Aristotle of classical logic is to analyze discourse. He was particularly concerned about the uh, sophists, but to analyze discourse and be able to uh, uh, actually understand whether uh, the arguments that were being put forth had an element of truth. So that was the goal uh, uh, of classical logic. It had nothing to do with uh, trying to actually uh, 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 achieve truth uh, like we do in science, but it was a very different thing, right? Um, anyway, so here's a, a quote from Aristotle that sort of like gives you the uh, gist of things. A deduction is speech in which certain things having been supposed, something different from those supposed results of necessity because of their being so. So the goal of logic is to find out what is it that is entailed by assumptions necessarily entailed by assumptions, right? So things get, go pretty far by using classic logic because then we can start to analyze stories and can make sure that the stories that we are telling uh, make sense. But then uh, uh, they emphasize one important aspect of stories that you are telling. That is that you cannot have contradictions. Contradictions are no, no in classic logic. And the way to see that is uh, to just look at what are the consequences of having a contradiction. So contradiction is something of the form A and not A. So if you have any statement and you have a negation of that statement at the same time, then you have a contradiction. And that's something that uh, uh, as scholars noticed very early on uh, as a problem because, well, you know, the Bible is filled with contradictions. For example, there are passages of the Bible that show that God is comp compassionate. Whereas there are other passages of the Bible that say that God is not compassionate. Sometimes he's uh, pretty nasty to people, sometimes he's pretty ni nice to people, right? So there's lots of contradiction in it. And, and the medieval scholars already noticed that, and they founded a whole field of uh, 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 studies called hermeneutics, where you try to understand those stories and give meaning to those stories uh, and make them consistent. Now, uh, and, and, and the reason why contradictions are a big problem, the reason why they bother us, is because if you have classic logic and contradictions, you have a logic that completely collapses. Your logic becomes trivial. 
you cannot get anything from it. In the following sense, let's say that you start with a contradiction. And then, because you have that contradiction, it follows from this statement, here, which is a contradiction, that A is true. Right? But if A is true for any sentence B, this also must be true because this is A or B. So if A is true, A or B must be true. That, that, that's a, 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 a statement of classical logic. It's an inference of classical logic, right? Um, notice that B can be anything. B can be, uh, uh, I have a nose on my forehead. Can, can be something completely crazy. Anything I want, right? Now, but if I now have this, and I use the assumption that not, B, not A is true, then it follows from this here that B must be true. So that means that if I have a contradiction, I can deduce anything from my logic. And therefore, using logic becomes completely useless. I cannot do anything with it. And of course, uh, uh, that's not an acceptable situation. So what you need to do is you need to avoid contradictions. There are things you can do to uh, uh, deal with that, but that was not known to uh, classical logicians. Uh, it's just known more recently uh, from the works in uh, power consistent logic in the 70s. But, uh, for classical logic, it's a death sentence to have a, a contradictory statement. So, logic now tells us what is it, as Aristotle puts, we can deduce as being certain if we know uh, 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 the premises or if we assume that the premises are true, right? Uh, but how do we deal with things that are not certain? How do we deal with uncertainty? And this is a later development that uh, uh, was uh, uh, done by the creation of uh, probability theory. And uh, um, I just want to quickly talk about the origins of probability theory uh, uh, by, uh, 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 um, you guys probably know that, uh, probability theories were created by Pascal. Uh, now, ironically, and I put here a contradiction or not, right? Uh, Pascal was a Jansenist, so he's a, very strict sects of uh, Christianity at the time, the Jansenists, uh, who was studying payoffs in games of chance, which of course were not something that Pascal would be engaged with, but he was uh, asked to uh, stu pay study payoffs in games of chance. And from that question, how is it that you deal with payoffs in games of chance, came the whole uh, 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 theory of uh, probabilities, or the beginning of the theory of probabilities. Now, um, there is one point that I want to emphasize right now, which is the theory of probabilities was created not as a descriptive theory. Pascal did not create the theory of probability to tell us how is it that people gambled. We know that people are pretty stupid when they gamble. No, what Pascal wanted to know is how is it that you should gamble if you don't want to be stupid, right? So what is the rational payoffs of gamble in a certain sense? That's where rationality is entering in, in, the, in this case, in the theory of probabilities. And uh, uh, I have a couple of uh, quotes from the uh, 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 logicist uh, uh, view of uh, uh, probabilities that I think sort of like emphasizes this point. So the probability that an event is three to one means, that's De Morgan, that in the universal opinion of those who examine this subject, the state, of the, mind, the state of mind to which a person ought to be able to bring himself is to look three times as confidently upon the arrival as upon the non arrival. So probabilities come out of what people should be thinking when they are making decisions if they think about this process carefully. Not what people usually do think, but what people should be thinking. So when we go back to, uh, uh, for example, uh, the paradoxes that we've been mentioning here, like the Ellsberg paradox or the uh, 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 violation of Savage's uh, sure thing principle, uh, the Morgan would say that there's no paradox there. It's just that people are stupid. Right? Or irrational, depending on uh, how you want to say it, right? But then there is some group that shows that they are not stupid and uh, neither irrational. Neither that, well, I'm going to I'm gonna get to that. Uh, uh, yes, yes, I, I'm going to get to that uh, 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 later on. But that, that's an important point, yeah. That there might be reasons for uh, uh, being irrational in that sense. So that's, that's why uh, the title of my talk is, uh, is Irrationality Irrational? And there is some uh, element of uh, rationality to irrationality. So uh, does this mean that you agree with me? Yes, yeah, yeah, so yeah. Yes. 
<laughs> you need to change your opinion then. <laughs> so another uh, quote, just to uh, uh, look at another famous guy, Bull. Probability I, con I conceive as to be not so much expectation as a rational ground for expectation. So it's not what people expect, but it's what rational people should expect. Um, and of course, uh, those ideas of probability were later on uh, formalized in a set theoretic sense by Komogorov. We heard a lot about Komogorov. And those are the uh, famous uh, axioms, uh, in a slightly different form, but it has the gist of it. Uh, the famous axioms of probability uh, of Komogorov. Probabilities are a number, a real number between 0 and 1. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, law of total probability satisfied the probability of a conjunction of A and, and B is the probability of A plus B if A and B are these joint sets. So that's a nice formalization of the theory of probability with the uh, uh, um, uh, uh, set theoretic uh, structure. OK, so rationality uh, helped us a lot in terms of uh, understanding the world we live in and in terms of telling very nice stories about the world we live in. So uh, just to uh, give some example, we have Galileo being in Italy, of course, I could not do without Galileo, right? Uh, um, we, and then uh, after Galileo, we have Newton, who uh, stood on uh, Galileo's shoulder. Uh, and then, of course, those guys here who followed them, I'm not so sure about Bohr, I'm not sure that he should be in that list because Certainly not the same uh, intellectual magnitude as certain of those guys here. But anyway, that's my, my opinion, uh, which I know is shared by many other people. I'm not sure about this audience here. But, uh, so you can get really far by thinking about things very rationally. And that's why we like uh, rational thoughts. Right? Now, but what about irrationality? Where does irrationality enter in this story? And I want to tell you first a very simple example now, I'm, I'm pretty bad at doing drawings, so this is not a sperm. There's like two eyes here, so it's a rat. And uh, uh, that's actually a rat in a tea maze. And this is a very uh, uh, simple experiment. You put a rat on a tea maze, the rat walks down this uh, 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 section of the tea maze, gets at the end, and the rat has a choice, either to go to the right or to go to the left. It's a very simple choice. And in this experiment, I do a non-contingent reinforcement. That means that regardless of what the rat does, 30% of the time I put food here, 70% of the time I put food there. So 30% of the time in the left, 70% of the time in the rat. Uh, oh, right, not rat. So what is it that the rat should do if the rat, rat were rational? What is it that you guys think the rat should do? If the rat wants to maximize its utility, which is getting food pellets. Rats do want to uh, get as many food pellets as they want. We know that from rat behavior. But what is it that the uh, rat should do in here? They are allowed to, to smell the, the difference in quantity of food, or they do already know where the food is placed. Or no, they, they don't. They, 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 the so they, they go in the maze, they choose a direction, they don't know where the food is, and after they choose, one of the doors is open with the food there. And if they, are, if they chose the right direction, they find the food there and they eat. If they chose the wrong direction, they don't get the food. And the reinforcement is completely non-contingent. And they do uh, continuously, continuously perform the experiment? They, they, they perform this experiment many, many times, yeah, yeah. With the same rat, of course, yeah. Yeah, so the rational choice for the rat is to always go to the right, right? Always go to the right. Now, what is it that you guys think the, uh, the, rat, the, the rat doesn't always go to the right? What is it that you guys think the rats do? No. No. So what's the next natural stopping point? I, I agree that 50% is a natural choice, right? Randomly choosing ones. But rats learn. They learn that there is more food in this side. And they learn that le there is less food in this side. So they prefer to go to that side. So what should be the natural probability? It's a matching of probability. After many trials, the rats start going to the right 70% of the time and to the left 30% of the time. So it's a very interesting uh, 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 behavior because it's not a random behavior. It's clearly a learned behavior. But yet, it's not a behavior that maximizes utility. 
So in that sense, it would be qualified by economists as an irrational behavior, right? Now, and uh, I, I like to say that in that sense, rats are closer to politicians than scientists because scientists tend to be more rational, whereas politicians uh, tend to be a more compromised kind of people, right? So uh, there is a, but, but, but that might be also a compliment to politicians, so I'm not sure that, that or uh, not a nice thing to say about rats. But anyway, um, if you think about it, is there a reason for rats to do that? And yes, there is a reason to do that because rats are not dumb as a species. They survived uh, many, many, many uh, 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 generations of rats as a species, right? And if you think about the uh, uh, maxima maximization of utility in that particular case, you maximize utility by always going to the right if you have stationarity. There is an underlying assumption that there is always going to be 70% of probability in the right and 30% of probability in the left. And if you do that, if you maximize utility as a species, you can disappear as a species because the environment is constantly changing. And this is the first uh, clue for us as to uh, uh, what is it that uh, 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 irrationality comes from. Comes from uh, 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 contextual cues from the environment that very often we choose to ignore when we're trying to be rational. But in fact, it's a pretty stupid thing to do. Uh, uh, and we can get in trouble. Like a famous example uh, um, is the tragedy of the commons. Now, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with tragedy. I'm sure that Emmanuel knows the tragedy of the commons. Uh, but it's uh, uh, pretty much the fact that, uh, and, and it happened many times, pretty much the fact that if you try to maximize your utility in a shared environmental situation, you deplete the environment. Now, that, that happened uh, 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 in Mesopotamia uh, many, uh, many uh, uh, thousands of years ago, right? Now, so, Maximization, maximization of utility is perhaps not even the best option for humans, and one could argue that it's perhaps not a rational uh, uh, option in many cases. But anyway, there are other types of uh, irrationality as well. And uh, uh, I, I want to uh, talk about a couple of them. Uh, so the disjunction fallacy, uh, you guys, uh, probably many of you know, but uh, just for completeness, I included here. Uh, you give students uh, uh, this uh, uh, particular set of uh, uh, questions, uh, whether Linda is a bank teller or Linda is a bank teller and is an active feminist, but you precede those questions with a story about Linda. You say, Linda is a 31-year-old, uh, single, outspoken, and very bright woman. She majored in philosophy. As a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination, social justice, and also participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. And then you ask people, which one of those sentences they think uh, are more probable uh, 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 to answer. Now, the interesting thing that happens here is if you give those sentences without that story at the beginning, people will pick two. The majority of people will pick two. Uh, sorry, uh, mo more probable they'll pick one. Uh, I, you see, I'm, <laughs> I'm being irrational here. Uh, the majority of people will pick one. But if you tell them this story, if you give them context, the majority of people will pick two. And uh, uh, this is similar to the uh, 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 story of the rat. The rat is choosing not to ignore things that uh, 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 might be important. Like, for example, it's a collective uh, history of uh, knowing that environment, environments change, food sources change. And here, uh, to, oops. To answer the uh, right question, you need to choose to ignore the cue that was given to you, the uh, uh, contextual cue that was given to you. So in a certain sense, it's related to that. Now, the other problem is uh, uh, violation of savages' sure thing principle, which is similar as well. You have two different contexts. One context is you ask a question of whether you prefer to buy a ticket or not, but you precede this by asking, uh, uh, would they buy a ticket if they pass the class? Or would they buy a ticket if they fail the class? And then uh, uh, in the second context, you tell them that they don't know whether they, uh, they passed or failed the class, but you ask them, would you buy a ticket anyway? And the uh, uh, changes, uh, the answers are not consistent among themselves. And the reason is that the context change. 
and people are not able to ignore the change of context. That's what rationality is asking us to do. Rationality is asking us to ignore that change of context. But uh, uh, um, we find it very hard to do. And in fact, the only way that we can do that is if we the only way that we can do that is if we consciously choose to ignore that, 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 that context by examining the uh, problem carefully like people uh, uh, said before, right? Like uh, De Morgan or, or Boole said we should do. Now, but of course, I think this is a little bit of a repetition, right? The context is, is what you really need there. That's, that's very important. And uh, that's a theme that, that I want to come back to uh, uh, later on. Uh, there is one uh, uh, other example that I like to, to give because it sort of like goes back to that uh, need that we have to tell stories, uh, which is a, a, a famous uh, uh, visit of uh, uh, Heisenberg to Bohr uh, in 1941 during the Second World War. As many of you know, uh, Heisenberg was working on the uh, uh, bomb, the atom bomb project for the Germans. And uh, uh, he had some uh, concerns about it and he went to Copenhagen to talk to uh, uh, Bohr. And of course, Copenhagen was occupied by the Nazis, and uh, uh, they couldn't have a very frank conversation, very uh, 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 open conversation. Uh, and uh, in particular, it was uh, troubling because uh, Heisenberg was working in a highly classified project, and he was talking with someone who was considered the enemy. Right? He was uh, talking to someone who was in an occupied country. And uh, uh, um, during his uh, visit, uh, Bohr's wife sort of like asks the question, why did he come to Copenhagen? Why did Heisenberg come here? What, what is the point of this visit? Right? And uh, this has actually been an uh, uh, object uh, of study uh, by many, many historians. What was the point of the visits of uh, Heisenberg? And what is it that he was trying to accomplish with it? But there is a very nice play. Uh, I don't know if you guys ever watched it. Uh, there is a BBC movie as well uh, called Copenhagen. And uh, uh, in that play, uh, they, they sort of like give different stories. Uh, they, they give, so the ghosts of uh, uh, Bohr, uh, Heisenberg, and Margaret, uh, Bohr's wife, meet uh, again to discuss that event. And the ghosts uh, give three different stories, three different versions of what happened. And this is sort of like summed up in this uh, uh, quote by uh, Heisenberg in the play, of course. That's not the real Heisenberg. Uh, but uh, no one, or the ghost of Heisenberg, if you will. No one understands my trip to Copenhagen. Time and time again, I've explained it to Bohr himself and Margaret, to interrogators and intelligence officers, to journalists and historians. The more I've explained, the deeper the uncertainty has become. Well, I shall be happy to make one more attempt. And the point of that story is that there is yet another reason to be rational. The reason is that very often facts are contradictory. Uh, in the same way that uh, uh, when uh, you read the Bible, you'll find contradictory statements and you need to reinterpret the Bible and reinterpret the statements in the Bible such that it makes sense, facts are also contradictory. Because when you look at facts, they don't exist outside of a context. They don't exist outside of uh, uh, ideas and uh, 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 symbolisms. And... Uh, uh, by facts, I'm being, uh, I'm being very loose with the term facts, by the way, so uh, uh, bear with me in that. So, uh, 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 and, and, and because facts are often contradictory, stories meaning is often constructed, and that story is not uniquely defined. You don't have only one story defined from the fact. And that's yet another source of irrationality, if you will. It's because you need to deal with information from the environment that it's not only contextual, but sometimes it's uh, downright inconsistent. So we sort of like can pinpoint many sources of uh, uh, irrationality that are not that irrational. It's just a way to cope with a, a, a very old uh, problem that we have of responding to a changing environment, responding to a very complex environment without ignoring things, because if we do, we can disappear as a species. Uh, uh, and at the same time, do it in a very quick manner uh, and, and, and such that you can still tell stories about where, where you uh, uh, got to be where you are. Hopefully I'm making sense in my story. Uh, so I now want to go to uh, 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 the description of irrationality. So we talk about the origins of irrationality. Perhaps 
uh, a little bit too much at length. Um, then uh, I talk about the uh, residues that we have of this uh, irrationality, but not only the, that residue, but also perhaps other uh, uh, ways of thinking about what are the origins of irrationality in a species that try to uh, uh, see itself as a rational species. And, uh, we're not necessarily that, right? I'm not going to even get into the uh, fact that most of our decisions are made unconsciously, but uh, just uh, imagining that uh, we are making those decisions consciously, we very often make them wrong, uh, according to some very rigid criteria of rationality. So I want to go back to the description of irrationality now. And of course, that means describing rationality as well. Now, there's a, a famous quote by uh, Wigner that he said that uh, 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 mathematics unreasonably describe nature. And if you think about what it really means to describe nature in terms of mathematics, what it means is that we're trying to express logical thinking, which in essence is what we mean when we talk about understanding something. When we understand something, we're telling a story uh, in a way that's consistent and such that uh, 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 it doesn't have any of those inconsistencies or logical inconsistencies that uh, I talked about before. And uh, uh, um, you can't do everything with logic, but you need a, something a little bit more powerful because otherwise the ideas get too complicated to deal with. And what we do is we describe things with uh, mathematics. But uh, if mathematics is used to describe rational things, how do we describe irrational information using mathematics? And of course, that's uh, 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 something that uh, uh, I want to uh, uh, talk a little bit more. Uh, one thing that I mean here is what kinds of reasonings that do not follow the standard rules of uh, uh, inference? So that would be things violating logic and probability. Uh, so that's one kind of uh, uh, irrationality that uh, uh, we might want to try to describe, right? So people making inferences that are not coming out of the uh, proper rules of inference. But another way to uh, 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 talk about irrationality is to talk about reasoning that is made from uh, conflicting information. Conflicting information might come from uh, uh, many different sources, including multiple contexts. So you, you, you make a decision about something in one context, and then you make a decision about the same thing in a different context, and your decisions are going to be different because of the uh, changes in context. Now, so, what is that? Uh, anyway. Push the wrong button here? OK. So reasoning of non-standard rules of inference is what we do when we look at the example of Linda is a bank teller. So just to see how that comes about, we can uh, uh, very quickly, using Komogorov's uh, uh, rule of uh, addition for these joint sets, we can prove that it entails that probability of B must less or equal than probability of A. So uh, this guy must be less probable than this, and people will answer the contrary, right? So they're not actually following the rules of inference that come out of uh, uh, Komogorov's uh, uh, axioms. And I, I might add that Komogorov's axioms, uh, one of the things that you can show, it's not a very rigorous proof, but one of the things that you can show is that if you want to have a measurement of belief that is a rational measurement of belief, in other words, you have a, 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 a measurement of belief that's consistent with the inferences that you make in a Boolean algebra. Might be a little bit too technical here. Uh, you can show that the only measure of belief that fits that is uh, Komogorov's uh, uh, structure. So it's, a, it's the axioms of probability. But anyway, um, this characteristic of having this guy containing this implying that probability of A is greater than probability of B is what we call monotonic reasoning. And uh, of course, people reason in a non-monotonic way. So how do you describe non-monotonic reasoning? I think that's what uh, uh, I want to talk about. Before I do, let me show you one example of uh, one type of uh, uh, um. So this is one type of reasoning, right? This is the type of reasoning about using wrong reasoning, using non-monotonic reasoning. Now I want to talk about a different type of reasoning that you also get in trouble, which is reasoning with conflicting information. Conflicting information in a very non-trivial uh, 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 way. 
So sometimes you have lots of uh, pieces of information and it gets to be very tricky. Uh, how is it that you combine those pieces of information? And uh, what I want is to uh, think about those cases where conflicts are not immediately uh, recognizable. Now, let me take the case of x, y, and z as being, this is a very contrived example. Um, this is the example that I'm going to be talking to more in more detail. But uh, I have three random variables, x, y, and z. And the idea is that they represent stock prices, future stock prices. Not today's, but future stock prices for three companies, x, y, and z. And if this guy is one, that means that the uh, stock price for company x is going to go up tomorrow, for example. If this guy is, if x is minus 1, that means that the stock price for company x is going to go down tomorrow. So I'm not taking into account the stocks that don't go up or down or just stay the same. So we're imagining that those guys go up and down. I like to always look at very simple cases because I can understand them. I'm, I'm very simple-minded very often, so I, I like to analyze uh, simple cases. Now, let's say now that you uh, hire three, you want to you wanna bet money in the stock market. You want to know what is it that you need to uh, do tomorrow to make some money. And you hire three experts, Alice, Bob, and Carlos. But it so happens that you didn't spend your money that wisely because Alice, Bob, and Carlos are very specialized. So Alice tells you that the only thing that she tells you is that the correlation between x and y is minus 1. That means that if the stock in the company x goes up, y goes down. Or if the stock in company x goes down, y goes up. That's the only thing that she knows, or she, she believes. That's her measurements. Uh, uh, it, it, it's her uh, subjective opinion about the uh, 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 future stocks of companies X and Y. She doesn't know anything about C, so she, Z, so she doesn't know, tell you anything about C. Now, Bob, on the other hand, tells you only things about X and Z. And he gives you this correlation. And Carlos, finally, uh, knows only about Y and Z. And he tells you that they're uncorrelated. There is no relationship between the stocks in X, uh, Y and the stocks in Z. So the question is, as a person who is going to bet on the stock markets, what should you do? So what is, what is your best line of action? Well, it so happens that you can't really use probability theory for this case because it's very easy to prove that for this correlations here, there is no joint probability distribution that you can compute. And therefore, you cannot combine the opinions of Alice, Bob, and Carlos such that you can get a full picture of the stock market uh, uh, behavior and perhaps bet on the triple moment, for example, which could give you an edge if you knew what the triple moment is. So this is different from this kind of uh, uh, reasoning, which is a non-monotonic reasoning. This is a reasoning that's uh, uh, you want to do with conflicting information. And you can't do that reasoning by using the standard tools uh, uh, that we have before. Now, there are some ways to do that with standard tools. Uh, 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 I'm not going to talk about those today, but I'm going to talk about tomorrow. So stay tuned. Um, in both cases, uh, what's happening is contextuality again. So we always come back to the same idea as we had before, contextuality. Uh, in the case of uh, the Linda uh, uh, example, uh, what's making people uh, reason in a non-monotonic way are the contextual cues. In the case of uh, 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 Alice, Bob, and Carlos, it's our insistence in having a probability space for x, y, and z for all those guys uh, that uh, is getting us into trouble because you cannot have that, uh, that probability space. So one of the things that uh, uh, you could think about is that Alice's view of company X is not the same as Bob's view of company X. So therefore, their subjective representation of company X is a different representation in their minds. So essentially, you have different companies, X for Alice and X for Bob. But of course, that's not a very satisfactory answer to me if I want to make a decision about what Alice and Bob are doing. right? But, but we could understand that in terms of different contexts. The context of information interpretations of Alice and the context of information and interpretations of Bob and Carlos. Um, so how is it that we deal uh, with this contextuality? And how, how is it that we deal with them in a more natural way? 
Now, of course, as we all know, uh, uh, otherwise we wouldn't be here in this, uh, what is it, ubiquitous quanta conference, right? Uh, is that we can use quantum mechanics to describe those guys. And uh, uh, the reason why we can use quantum mechanics is because we know that quantum mechanics doesn't satisfy uh, the monotonicity of classical probability theory. A very famous example is the case of uh, uh, the double slit experiment, right? That's, that, that's the case that Einstein said was the uh, uh, most important mystery of quantum mechanics. Uh, thank you, Feynman, yes. Yeah, again, I'm, I'm, I'm putting two people of different minds in the, uh, yeah, but anyway. Yes, Feynman. Einstein, Feynman. But anyway. Um, keep pressing this button here. Uh, why is it that the double slit is non-monotonic? Because when you have only one slit open, the probability of finding a particle at a certain point in the screen is greater than when you have two slits open. That's exactly the case of the uh, uh, paradox that we had before. How is it possible that having more than one way to get to the slit, to, to the screen, gives you less than if you have only one way to get to the screen? That's a puzzling characteristic of the two slit experiments uh, if we uh, describe it purely in terms of probability. Right? Um, and the way that we deal with this in quantum mechanics is uh, we use quantum interference. We can use classical interference, but in quantum mechanics we use quantum interference and describe those guys with quantum states and so on. So the question is whether we can use uh, quantum uh, uh, formalisms to describe non-monotonic reasoning. And in the same way, can we use quantum formalisms to describe uh, uh, those guys, uh, Alice, Bob, and Carlos' uh, uh, reasoning as well, right? So can you use that to, uh, to describe violations of standard probability inferences? Um, let's see if I want to talk. I'm not sure I want to talk about this too much. Uh, just to say that uh, uh, if we look at the main things about quantum mechanics, what we're really want to focus on is contextuality, but let me uh, uh, stay away of the controversies with Sandro here. And, uh, uh, but another alternative, so, so the quantum formalism is not the only alternative. There is another alternative that uh, uh, we could consider as well, which is to use non-standard probabilities. And tomorrow I'm going to talk uh, about them in more details. For the moment, uh, I, I just want you guys to uh, suspend your disbelief and uh, uh, Believe me when I tell you that you can actually make sense out of this very strange guy called negative probabilities by using a, a, a concept that's related to them called upper probability distributions, which were created by Definetti. Uh, I don't know how many of you uh, heard of Definetti, uh, very well known in Italy, right? Uh, although he was born in Innsbruck, but... Uh, yeah, even... Yes, I know that, yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, um, upper probabilities are a measurement of uh, inconsistent um, subjective beliefs. So the question is, how can we describe those things with uh, upper probabilities or accordingly with negative probabilities that are easier to compute and we can give uh, 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 an interpretation of that? Uh, because both of those cases, upper probabilities and negative probabilities, uh, exhibit non-monotonicity. And you can apply them to quantum mechanical systems. For example, you can apply to EPR, you can apply to GHZ, and all those uh, nice things from quantum mechanics, uh, if you wish. Um, so one alternative, quantum mechanics. The other alternative, uh, uh, non-standard probabilities. Uh, and One reason why I became interested in uh, 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 negative probabilities is that we sort of like can understand them in terms of a basic underlying uh, neural model. I'm not going to get too uh, 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 caught up on that in here, but uh, 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 the basic gist of it is that cortical neurons, they sort of like have this collective behavior that can be a thought of in terms of uh, interference. And therefore, you can have contextuality with cortical neurons. We don't even need to use uh, 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 interference for, for contextuality of neurons, but in this case, it's very clear cut where, where they can come from. Um, so it's not interference in the real space, but it's interference in the virtual space. 
Uh, no, this is interference in the real space, but it's not interference uh, 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 of a. Uh, uh, Yes, it's interference in the real space. Why quantum interference is interference in the more abstract things? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, so, and one of the things that uh, I, I like about this is because, to me, and this is uh, speculative, of course, uh, uh, we evolved to deal with these uh, very complex sets of uh, uh, contradictory. Uh, 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 pieces of information, right, from the context and from everything that we're gathering with our sensory, uh, 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 well, uh, with sensory information, right? And uh, uh, negative probabilities are very computationally cheap to, to get done. Um, so uh, uh, to me, that has a, a, a nice... Um, uh, reason to, uh, to use, because if you have something that's computationally cheap to do with those uh, uh, interference of waves in the brain, then uh, perhaps there is something to be said about that. But uh, again, this is uh, sort of like a not very polished argument uh, that needs to be uh, uh, elaborated a little bit more. Now, there is one thing that I want to uh, now emphasize when I'm talking about that that goes back to the point that uh, I made before of the origins of probability, right? So probabilities, they were created to be normative. In the same way that logic was created to be normative. What I mean by that is that they were created to tell us what is it that we should do. So in terms of logic, logic was created to tell us what kinds of arguments we should accept. And uh, probabilities were created to tell us what kinds of decisions we should make or what kinds of things we should do, right? Um, they were not meant to be uh, descriptive. And I think that the interesting question now is to ask about those descriptions in here. Uh, sorry. The uh, negative probabilities and the Hilbert space formalisms, do they have these normative characteristics or they are just uh, uh, descriptive? So probabilities provide a way to make rational decisions, that means to be a normative. But they have problems when inconsistent is given because there is no joint probability distribution. So how is it that you use probabilities to get a normative answer it becomes very tricky. One of the ways, of course, is to use Bayesian methods. But that has its problems as well. I'm going to show them in the next slide. I'm going to talk about them again. I'm trying to plug my talk for tomorrow to see if people come at least to talk tomorrow. Um, well, Andrea hopefully is going to be here, right? There you go. Um, and uh, uh, um, negative probabilities or Hilbert space formalisms don't have these kind of problems. You can use them to deal with those inconsistencies. Whereas classical uh, probability theory, you can't do anything because you don't have a joint probability distribution. So you need to put more apparatus uh, in it such that you can do something. And then as you put more things, you start to get uh, other sorts of problems. Uh, but negative probabilities have a nice characteristic over the Hilbert space formalism that they can provide the best set of decisions that approach rationality. So I can, I, I can construct a joint negative probability distribution for a given set of events. And then I can ask, what is this joint probability distribution that's the closest the possible to a rational decision? It's not possible to get a rational decision out of inconsistent things, but it's possible to ask how close to a rational decision you can be. And negative probabilities allow you to get very close, as close as you can, to a rational decision. And then you can ask, OK, so now what is it that I should do? So negative probabilities in that sense can have a normative aspect to it. They can tell you what exactly you can do. Um, so just to uh, summarize what I said, so uh, inconsistencies cannot allow you to, for example, in the case of Alice, Bob, and Carlos, to compute the triple moment, x, y, and z. Uh, so to compute that, you need to uh, change your approach. So one of the things that you can do is you can increase your probability space uh, uh, by including a third uh, a person, the decision maker, in your probability space. Uh, not probability space, but uh, uh, um, 
uh, you, you decrease the uh, uh, amount of information, sort of, uh, uh, what the experts are telling you. And uh, uh, you can use a Bayesian approach. And one of the things that you can show is that the Bayesian approach is very misleading because when you compute the triple moment, the triple moment is completely independent of the opinion of the experts. So it doesn't tell you anything whatsoever about what is it that the experts think. It's not affected by that. It's not affected by those opinions that you paid good money for your experts to tell you about. Right? The quantum one, on the other hand, um, has a triple moment that depends completely on the choice of state and therefore is completely arbitrary, the triple moment that you get. So in a certain sense, y y you have sort of like the same thing happening for the quantum model as you do for the uh, uh, classical Bayesian model, except that, ironically, the quantum model makes the uncertainty explicit, whereas the Bayesian model hides the uncertainty under the rug. And you need to dig a little bit further to see that, that you are actually hiding something in there. And uh, that's a very disturbing thing. Uh, whereas negative probabilities, uh, they actually put lower and upper bounds on this guy. So it's not like everything goes. If you try to approach the, most, the, the best you can a rational decision, negative probabilities will put lower and upper bounds for that triple moment. Because uh, if you think about it, the triple moment that you have can only be something between minus 1 and 1, right? Because this is the product of uh, 1, uh, 1, 1, 1, 1, right? So hopefully uh, uh, the story that I told you guys made some sense. Uh, maybe most of it, uh, maybe some of it, right? Maybe the whole thing breaks down. But here's what I try to, uh, uh, to, to tell you guys, that uh, uh, if we start with rational descriptions uh, 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 for the world we live in, uh, those rational decisions, uh, they uh, have had a very important uh, 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 role uh, in human history, including uh, 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 very important decisions that we made in the past that allowed us to survive uh, catastrophic climate change, whereas our uh, relatives died because they were in an evolutionary dead end. And the reason why we survived was because we had a brain that was powerful enough to uh, tell us those consistent stories that we're trying to tell. Um, now, but we live in a world that's not necessarily perfect. It's filled with inconsistencies, either because of our own uh, uh, imperfections, uh, sensorial imperfection, imperfections, but because uh, uh, we're also trying to uh, uh, give things in the world we live in meaning. We're trying to create concepts. Uh, uh, Sandro uh, appreciates that uh, uh, reference to concepts, I hope. Uh, we try to uh, create concepts, and concepts are not the same thing as the real thing. Uh, we can't talk about consistency of the world, but we can only talk about consistency of our representations of the world in terms of concepts. And uh, 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 when we uh, represent those things uh, uh, in our brains, uh, very often we have inconsistencies uh, because information is either contradictory or because the context is where, uh, contexts where those uh, pieces of information come from are different. And uh, uh, we evolved to deal with those inconsistencies. We had to because we live in a world that has uh, uh, those kinds of information uh, all the time, right? So in the case of the rats, uh, going to the right to the left and uh, being in a, an environment and assuming that it's uh, 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 stationary uh, is inconsistent with what we know about environments in general. They are not stationary. Um, I don't think that the rat is completely aware of the fact that he's in the lab, right? And uh, that scientists have uh, very well controlled experimental conditions. And I, I don't think rats understand that. So uh, it's reasonable to uh, think that. Uh, uh, they uh, uh, would not make a crazy assumption like stationarity. Um, and uh, irrational reasoning or reasoning with consistent information can be accomplished with many different approaches. Uh, uh, um, the two of them that uh, uh, I think are relevant uh, in here are the Hilbert space formalism and uh, uh, the uh, uh, extended probabilities formalism. And uh, um, what I want to uh, uh, end up with uh, as a point is that uh, uh, extended probabilities seem to offer us a normative uh, 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 aspect that the quantum approach doesn't seem to offer. 
So uh, um, it would be interesting to, uh, first of all, know whether this normative uh, 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 approach that uh, uh, quantum uh, 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 negative probability give us uh, can be uh, uh, empirically verified or not. In other words, do you gain any uh, uh, useful things from, uh, uh, from it or not? Can you, can you make money in the stock markets? Right? Um, well, I, uh, I'm not rich yet, so I can assure you that I don't know how to do that. Um, but uh, the other question is, uh, um, what is it that we need to add to the quantum formalism, which is very, very broad, uh, and allow you many, many intermediate uh, 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 values that the uh, uh, negative probability doesn't, can we add something to the quantum formalism such that the quantum formalism becomes as close as possible to a rational decision and therefore uh, gains a certain uh, uh, normative uh, 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 power? So that's, that's the uh, uh, main summary of uh, what I want to talk to you. Well, thank you. Uh, so thank you very much for your talk. It was really, really interesting. This is the, the, the first time that I really <laughs> follow your, <laughs> your talk. And uh, it's, yes. And uh, so you agree with, uh, with us in several aspects, I, I think. So you don't have to object too much. But uh, I would like to avoid uh, a logical loop in my reasoning. And uh, so uh, may I say, following your perspective, that rational behavior is, uh, is a behavior that follows, for example, Boolean logic, or more generally, Kolmogorovian probability? Um, is this one? Because if you refer to normative things, uh, otherwise, I create a logical loop in, uh, in, all, in all this. So if you start with uh, your definition that, that was, was OK, or what is a rational behavior, then it seems to me that a natural conclusion is something of this kind. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is yeah. it so? Yeah. Uh, Th uh, then uh, I yes. have a, another question, <laughs> yeah, De yeah, yeah. depending on what you answer. So uh, um, to me, uh, 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 it's not as much as what I think is rational behavior, but it's what most people mean mm -hmm. when they talk about rational behavior, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but in a certain sense, and uh, 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 that, that's why I mentioned the uh, uh, um, uh, tragedy of the commons. Uh, in a certain sense, I think that uh, many of the things that people believe are rational behavior are irrational because they're not taking into account many of the contextual information that they should be taking into account. So, for example, um, um, uh, many uh, people in the Foundations of Probability uh, uh, mentioned that one of the things that you do when you're talking about probabilities is ignoring all the things that are irrelevant uh, 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 pieces of information to what you want to study. And uh, uh, our brain doesn't ignore those things. And uh, I, I think there is a reason for us not to ignore those things. And, uh, 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 it's, uh, it's kind of like uh, 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 perhaps dangerous for us, including for us as a species, to ignore things that our brain actually tells us we shouldn't do, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so when we try to be uh, extremely rational, for example, trying to maximize uh, a utility function or something like that, we end up uh, 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 losing more than uh, gaining mm -hmm. because we lose lots of... Uh, so, but, but then the sec second aspect, uh, if you uh, well, uh, if you want to try to if you want to represent uh, the in in a mathematical model what uh, subjects really do. So it's my, my cell phone is ringing, so <laughs> I cannot concentrate. <laughs> excuse me, excuse me. This is a problem. Okay. So if you want to model to provide a mathematical model uh, that. Uh, uh, represent uh, real behavior, for example, in specific situations, decision making and so on, then uh, the mathematical model you can construct to, to fit the data is, uh, is a descriptive model. Yes. So it has nothing to do with rationality, which should be connected with a more normative notion. 
Correct. Okay. Yes. Yeah. But then, uh, you know that if you consider quantum logic, another aspect. Okay. If you consider quantum logic, uh, typically one says that uh, it formalizes a notion of truth, which is different from the classical one, the notion of quantum truth, for example. This is, this is what standard logicians typically do, for example, the Dalla Chiara School or something of this kind. So my question is, uh, does it make, make sense to try to reconstruct uh, from a normative point of view the rationality that underlies uh, real behavior? <coughs> so, does uh, it uh, make sense, this, for you? Yeah, so, so let me give you a, a, a fairly uh, convoluted uh, answer to that. that uh, uh, it's an interesting question and it's a difficult one to answer, right? Uh, but, uh, but remember, I mentioned that uh, one of the things that you can prove, and it's called Cox's theorem, uh, uh, after a, 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 a physicist actually uh, who uh, proved uh, uh, that particular theorem. It's a fairly long theorem to prove. Um, uh, but it's possible to prove that if you have measures of belief, if, if you want to construct a function that's a measurement, a measure of belief. And you want that measure of belief to be a rational measure of belief. So you start with a set of assumptions, and the set of assumptions are certain measures of belief that you have about propositions, right? Then if you want to be rational, what you want to do is you want to say that whatever um, um, belief you have of things that could be derived from those uh, series of uh, beliefs that you had to begin with, your initial sets of beliefs, should be consistent with a Boolean algebra. And uh, if, if you require that, so if you require the Boolean algebra, or if you require the classical logic, is another, thing about that, or another way to think about that, as a, uh, a criteria for rationality, in that case, of uh, rationality of measures of belief, you get uh, Komogorov's axioms, right? Now, one thing that you can do then is uh, relax that. So instead of asking to have a Boolean algebra, you uh, instead start with a quantum lattice, right? Which has a, 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 a weaker structure than a Boolean algebra. And uh, of course, you have like a, a, as truth values the uh, a, a quantum logic, uh, uh, yeah. So uh, um, if you do that, you can show that uh, uh, you can modify Cox's theorem, and you can show that you can actually not prove Komogorov's axioms anymore, but, um, let me go back to Komogorov's axioms. What changes is that this guy here is not an equality, but it's an inequality. Now, uh, instead of having then that the probability of A union B is equal to PA plus PB, you get that the probability of A union B is greater or equal than PA uh, plus PB, or you can get also that the probability of A union B is less or equal than PA uh, plus PB. And what this is, uh, of course, uh, you guys know this comes from, uh, this is the violation of uh, uh, the law of uh, uh, total probability, and it's completely consistent with quantum mechanics, right? Yes, but it's also very tightly linked with the fact that the double set experiment actually uh, solicits Yes, yeah, it's yeah. Uh, but, but more interestingly to me uh, is the fact that by changing this, they write exactly, where is it? Oh, I don't have it here. Well, they write exactly Definati's axioms of upper probabilities. That's what Definati did. Definati changed the axioms of probability and he called upper probabilities as when you have greater or equal and lower probabilities when you have less or equal. So uh, uh, I, I think that that's sort of like the uh, 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 longer contrived perhaps version of my answer to, to, to you is that when you change the logic and then you uh, uh, weaken the logic that would be equivalent in terms of a representation uh, with uh, uh, upper uh, and lower probabilities, which is equivalent to negative probability distribution. So there, is, th th there are some uh, uh, not necessarily uh, uh, straightforward representation theorems that go in both ways, but there is some uh, strong connection between those guys. I would love to prove some representation theorems, of course, but uh, uh, I haven't yet. And, uh, 
So that, that, does that answer what uh, you're, you're asking? Or, uh? No, but it makes me reflect. Oh, OK. Yeah, so. But it's interesting what, what you say, because the Pinetti is also often used in uh, some pieces of economic theory. Yeah. So we may want to check that out. Yeah, so Definetti is one of the big subjectivists. And, uh, and notice that the example that I constructed here is, uh, uh, is strongly subjective, because what I'm asking is, what are the opinions of those uh, experts? So I'm not asking about something that could be done in terms of sampling of the uh, 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 random variables x, y, and z, because if I were doing that, then I would be actually measuring the market. I would have all the three variables being measured simultaneously. And therefore, I would have a joint probability distribution. So I would never get those correlations. Those correlations exist only because I'm looking at subjective uh, 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 opinions of experts that are intrinsically uh, 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 inconsistent, which sort of like goes uh, a little bit uh, in the direction of what you guys were talking about this morning when we had that conversation. Yeah, definitely. You could, you could moderate also as well with uh, stuff like an uncertain measurement, uh, say, uncertain joint measurements of the on the stock market, for example. Yeah. So instead of, uh, say, having these uh, uh, different opinions uh, of people, it could be <coughs> as well a measurement, but you do have a defect in the measurement, so you are not 100% sure that, that the answer to your measurement is yes. correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, uh, you could also take Bayesian approaches uh, based on that and uh, uncertainties and give credibility to uh, experts, for example, or you could give, give a theory of experts, and then, yeah, there, there are many... Uh, uh, approach to that, and uh, so that's a, one of the things that I'm uh, going to try to convince you guys tomorrow is that there is a lot of uh, 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 advantages of using uh, negative probabilities. It's, it's just like an elegant way to, uh, to deal with all those kinds of problems. Any other one additional question, or do we switch directly to Professor Haven's talk? Any? Okay. Then thanks again, uh, Thank Professor you. De Barros, for, for his nice talk.